Have you ever done something in anger only to regret it later, standing in the rubble of your own anger? It may be your own mistake. Like, have you ever done the thing where you replied to somebody who sent something and you were kind of angry coming back to them, and then the strangest thing happened, somebody who you didn't send the email to responds back to you, and you go, "Uh uh-oh, I hit reply all. And now your anger has been exposed to everybody who was on that email thread. Okay, just me. Well, maybe you've also done the one I've done where, you know, you're angry at somebody and so you open up a text message and you're going to text your friend about them and what they did and what you're angry about. But because the other person's on your mind, you put their name into the two and you start typing out the message and you hit send. And now you just sent your anger directly to the person you were angry about and didn't want to know about it. I, I do wonder if that's why they've updated our phones so that we can edit the messages afterwards and we're like, whoop, delete that rant. How are you? Just thinking about you today. Hope they didn't see the first one. I I read an article published by CBS which said that 84% of Americans believe that we are more angry than the previous generation. Do you feel it? I I read that in that study also 42% of people admitted that they were personally angry. And can I just maybe add the the pastor's column to that? That's 42% of people who are self-aware about their anger. Have you felt the outrage? Have you felt the anger in our society? That article listed a bunch of different reasons. Maybe there's some of the very reasons that you experience anger in your life. It says top five, financial stress about inflation, politics, social media. People said, my boss sure makes me angry, and they said, bad weather. I mean, what makes you angry these days? What makes your friends and your family angry these days? And it's not just in America. I I read a rather amusing article about anger in Nigeria. There's a whole new booming business over there. It's called a rage room. And for just trading $5, they will give you a baseball bat and a helmet and a room full of old electronics and say, have fun, take care of your anger. And I just thought it was so interesting. They interviewed the woman who owns the business of the rage room afterwards, and they said, does it actually help? And she said, I quote, not really. I refer a lot of people to therapy afterwards. (laughs) Uh, Have you noticed it? Have you noticed it in yourself or around you? I think it comes out in all sorts of different ways. Tirades in traffic, fights in the family room, rants online. It seems all too often that perhaps in our own anger, we're left standing in the rubble of what our anger created, saying, ah, there's the outburst of anger. I promise I'm never going to do that again. I don't want to be standing here. And then the cycle repeats over and over and over again. And here's where I want to start, is where I think our society knows that we're angry. And I think most people would admit there's anger inside of me, too. Perhaps we don't understand what the solution is. What is the antidote for anger? How do we have healthier and holier relationships? It's what Jesus is going to talk about today in a message I've given the title to God's Antidote for Anger. We're in week three of a series called Heaven is at Hand, which was the words of Jesus when he opened up and started to preach his Sermon on the Mount. We've talked about it over the past few weekends, how Jesus is flipping everything upside down in his kingdom. That it's not just about these new rules for mildly better living or a new spin on religion. Jesus is saying, I have come to extend a brand new life to you. And this life is going to feel pretty upside down from the way that the world works and perhaps the way that your life is working or has worked in the past. But Jesus said, there's something I want you to experience today. We often think about heaven as tomorrow, which heaven is a place tomorrow. But Jesus said heaven's at hand. Heaven is something that we want to experience today. And I want to just tell you at Miracle City, that is our heart. We do not exist here to be like a Christian education center or like to be your one religious service of the week. We want you to experience what Jesus has for you. We want you to live a new life and experience the power that comes through a new relationship with Jesus Christ. We, we talked a few weeks ago about the blessings of that, the upside-down beatitudes. We talked last week about better and brighter, being salt and being light. And, and perhaps this message, you can almost think of it like a part two to last week. 
in an age of outrage, in a city of outrage, in a nation of outrage, in your life of outrage, how do we be salt? How do we be light? What solution does Jesus offer? So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5 today, if you've got a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we'll always have the scriptures up on screen as well. And can I just invite the Holy Spirit in? Can I say, Holy Spirit, come teach this morning? We need wisdom and revelation from you about anger because you know us, because you love us, because you want to do something powerful this weekend in our church. We just believe it, and we're coming to you with open hands. In Jesus' name, if you believe it, say amen. Say amen and amen. Perhaps we should start by defining anger. I'm going to talk under four headlines today, defining anger and let Jesus define it for us. In in Matthew 5, 17, here's where we left off last week. Jesus says, don't think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And then in verse 20, he says, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, when Jesus begins talking about anger, he says, I'll give you a definition, but you're going to need some context, and you're going to need some context that goes way back to what he calls the law and the prophets. See, to every Jewish person who's sitting listening to the Sermon on the Mount, they're thinking the same thing that you might be thinking, or you certainly should have thought before following Jesus. Who is this guy? What's he talking about? And like, is Jesus just starting this crazy cult, or is what he's saying going to line up with what God has already told us? And for a Jew, that would have been Exodus chapter 20. That would have been the Ten Commandments, where God gave his law. Now, God gave a lot more laws than that. 613, he draws out that all link into the Ten Commandments. There's 248 positive commandments. 365 negative thou shalt not. And I'll just be the first to say, who in the world can remember 613 commandments? I mean, we'll know the big ones, right? Don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't murder anybody. But like, who knows all 613 commandments? Well, there were people in their day that would have said, they'd be maybe sit in the front row and say, whoa, we do, we do, we do. It was the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It was the religious people of the day. Now, it's not that they could do them perfectly, but they would often look at normal, just regular old people, and they would point out their flaws in the way that they weren't obeying them. So it would kind of make them feel better. Maybe you've had like a run-in with a really religious person, and they're pointing out all of your flaws and everything you were doing wrong, but they never pointed out anything in themselves either, and kind of sat on a pedestal above everyone else. That was the Pharisees and the Sadducees, so you could have imagined a little bit of their shock when Jesus said, hey, you know the really religious people who you think are perfect? They're not good enough. Unless your righteousness surpasses the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you can't get in. See, because they thought, well, maybe you think, if I'm a good person, I will get into heaven. If I can follow the law is good enough. You know, like if I've got more good than bad. Or, you know, if I can find some way for, you know, the line to be a little bit this way, and then I'm on this side, and then it's pretty good, and maybe if I can make other people feel like they're on the wrong side of the line, I think that's good for me, and I'll get some extra credit. And yet Jesus steps up in the Sermon on the Mount and says, no, none of that is good enough. I I haven't done any of that. And by the way, I haven't lowered the bar of the law. I came to fulfill the law. You say, what does that mean? Well, as people have said often, there's two ways you can destroy an acorn. One is you can take a hammer and you can smash it to bits. But the other is you can take it and you can plant it into the ground. And that acorn will fulfill its purpose and grow into a mighty oak tree. See, if you thought that Jesus was coming to teach. Here's some new rules in some new ways that I'm going to lay the hammer down on you on some new laws and just try better and do harder, but you'll never make it. Jesus says, you're not thinking about this right at all. I have come to fulfill the law. There's a totally different and new kingdom. See, that's what the prophets would often talk about. 
they would say that even the good things we do don't necessarily come from the best motives. I mean, even at your best moments, is it always a pure motive that you serve and you love God? Or sometimes it's, it gets a little filthy in there because I want something from God or I think I kind of want God to move the line for me or I think God will bless me or do something for me. I mean, Isaiah just calls it out. He says, even your best deeds are like filthy rags before the holiness standard of God. And yet the prophets would always declare this, that what you don't need is new rules or being better at obeying the rules. That's just religion. They would say, we need a new heart. You need a different wellspring of your actions. I mean, Ezekiel, the prophet, thundered in Ezekiel 36. He said, through the, the voice of God, through him, and I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you, and I will take out this stony, stubborn heart, and I'll give you a tender, responsive heart. Uh, listen to me. Jesus is not offering to destroy you with new rules. He's offering to deposit a new heart in you. See, this is when Jesus said, heaven is at hand. Don't miss what he was saying, is heaven offers a new heart. There's something completely different that he wants to do in your life that he says begins in you. As Oswald Chambers said, Jesus never teaches us to curb or suppress the wrong disposition. He gives us a totally new disposition that alters our mainspring of action. Now let me pause, because the type A's in the room are like waiting on your notebook. They're like, wait, what's the definition for anger? What in the world does that have to do for anger? Jesus would say, very good. That's the context you need, because it has everything to do with anger. Verse 21, he says, you've heard it said. And they're like, yeah, okay. To the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. And everybody there would have said, yeah, we have heard that. That's one of the Ten Commandments. All right, okay, Jesus, you're, you're talking our language. But we got that one. Everyone there, like, anybody murdered today? And they're like, no, we haven't murdered. Okay, so we're good. We're righteous. This is awesome. And then Jesus says, but, and then they're like, wait, what do you mean? He says, I tell you that anyone who's angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to their brother or sister, raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fires of hell. And I imagine it was this silent at this moment on the Sermon on the Mount as well, where people were like, oh, I, like, I kind of like the blessing thing or the salt and light thing, but Jesus just kind of went all, he kind of went all dark on us because if that's the case, maybe I'm not so righteous. I mean, if the law extends not just to my actions, but also the motives of my heart, well, then I, I think I, I might be I might be in trouble here. See, Jesus begins to talk about a spirit of anger that's formed in the heart. Now, to be clear, not all anger is wrong. I mean, the Bible says anger in and of itself is not a sin. I mean, Paul says in Ephesians 4, 26, be angry and don't sin. The kind of anger that Jesus is addressing is ultimately the definition you've got to understand is that anger defends something you love. That if something comes in between me and my wife, Lindsay, I should righteously be angry at that thing or that person. Why? Because I love my wife. I mean, you see Jesus doing this. When things, when he got righteously angry, like at the temple, when the people had turned it into a zoo of sacrifice instead of a house of prayer, he got righteously angry. He got righteously angry at injustice. But Jesus is saying that kind of anger can also get sinful, and it can get sideways on us. When you look at another person and you say, Raka. Raka was their word for kind of like an official name calling. It's the word that means idiot, nitwit, and numbskull. And then he says, the same thing is for you fool. The Greek word that's in, uh, uh, in, in Sermon on the Mount is mora. Mora. It's where we get the word moron from. It's, it's a playful tone, but it's not a good dis disposition against people. He says, even if you just say, you fool, you get the fire of the hell. You notice how Jesus is flipping everything upside down again? He says, if you got legitimate anger, you're kind of going to the lowest court. If you name call against someone, 
Well, you're going to like the highest court in the land, and if you simply say, you moron, well, the fires of hell are coming for you. See, because the anger we tend to think is small, God treats as big. Because even in our anger, it can defend the things we love. Our anger can also destroy the things that God loves. And it's this little thing that links angry and name-calling all the way to murder is a little word called contempt. And a spirit of contempt looks at other people and says, you're really not worth anything. For all intents and purposes, you have no value and you are dead to me. And Jesus says, you don't have to actually commit murder to have a spirit of contempt to look at somebody else and say, you are worthless to me, and whether you die or not makes no difference to me. He says, that's what links it in your heart. See, sinful anger is contempt in action. And while it's easy for us to maybe sit here and say, well, man, forget this sermon, I'm not a murderer, maybe it's harder for all of us to say, well, I might have contempt. Because, I mean, isn't that the world we live in? Isn't that some of the personal world that we exist in in and of ourselves? Where it's like the people that live that way, the people that dress that way, the people that vote that way, the people that do those things, that person that did that thing to me, nitwit, numbskull, fool, worth nothing to me. And I just think it's kind of interesting, isn't it? How contempt works. That the people who we have said are completely worthless to us somehow demand all of our life's anger and attention towards them. I mean, you can see it in the Pharisees, can't you? The Pharisees who looked at Jesus and said, you're worthless. You're nothing but this knockoff Jewish cult leader. You're worth nothing to us. But the anger grew and grew and grew until they crucified him and they murdered him. And that's the danger of contempt. I want to talk under that headline. The danger of contempt is while we tend to recognize that murder is bad, duh. It's harder to recognize the contempt that can mask itself in simply insulting someone or calling somebody a name. Hey, I'll start with, with me. I was on a walk with my wife and, and son uh, a few weeks ago when I was studying this passage, and I was like, God, if there's any contempt in me, I want to know because wow, this thing seems to hide and kind of lurk beneath the surface of my heart. And uh, we, we live in Minneapolis, and there's some really interesting blocks of Minneapolis, and we're walking by one, and isn't just, we're in election season, and everybody's got to have a yard sign, don't they? That's great. You got your opinions. You got your, your yard. That's great. But everyone has a yard sign, and there was these yards that had a yard sign here, and then this other neighbor kind of like pointed their yard sign at their yard sign to kind of shout at their yard sign. Minnesotans, they're not going to talk about it. They're just passive-aggressively saying, like, that's what I think about your yard sign. And so we're walking about this whole block, and at the very end, Man, there was, there's some creative ones. There's the people who buy the yard signs, and then there's the people who make the yard signs. And this person made the yard sign on their, like, color printer. It was, like, kind of blurry font. They laminated it kind of poorly, stuck it on some coat hangers, and put it on their lawn. And at the end of this block, I was just turned to Lindsay. I was like, can you believe what that says? Because it was really degrading, what it was, what it was saying about people made in the image of God. I said, can you believe who lives in that house? What fools they are. Don't they even understand the logic of this? How idiotic do those people have to be? And Lindsay turned to me, and she's like, why are you so angry? Like, what's, what's going on? And then it hit me. That's contempt. See, I, I, I wanted to defend the people that God loves in our world. And at the same moment, I was turning with contempt to other people that God loves in the world. See, the danger of contempt, because contempt is often concealed, isn't it? It's hard to know when it's there, because God not only judges our actions, he judges the motives of our heart, and when outbursts of anger are easier for us to address, it's really hard to know the deeper heart's motives and to fix the things that we know will fix the outbursts of anger. And it gets even more complicated because it can be tied into so much stuff in your story. Please hear me as your pastor. Anger can be woven into legitimate wrongs and sins that were done against you, in your divorce, in your abuse, in the ways that people have looked down on you, in systemic issues in our society. 
I mean, it's how you were raised. There's trauma that can come into your life. There's spiritual strongholds that can be developed over many, many years, and anger is a part of that. But hear me also as your pastor, if it's left unchecked and undiscovered, it can turn into a spirit of contempt that can destroy you and that can destroy others. And so the next question we ought to ask is, well, if I can't see it in me, how do I detect contempt? If this thing is in my heart that Jesus thought was so important to talk about during the Sermon on the Mount, detecting anger. And this is where Jesus gets really specific, and I think he gets really helpful. And he says it like this way. It says, therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. <gasps> okay, so you guys didn't do what they would have done that day, but can you just play along? Because everyone would have been, this is the moment of the sermon where they're gasping. Can you just, with me, <gasps> okay, here's why you're gasping now. Because to a Jew, you did not leave your gift at the altar. This was the place where you brought your gift. Because God made one way for people who are trapped and stranded in sin to be made right with the holy God. And instead of their life being demanded from them, because remember, Jesus said, unless you're more holy than the holiest unholy people on earth, you're not going to get in. God's standard is perfection. He said, I'll make a way that you don't have to give your life, but an innocent animal can represent the life that you owe. And you can put it onto an altar, and there would be a blood sacrifice because sin is like a blood disease that runs within us. And he said, that's how you can be brought back into fellowship with a holy God. So make no mistake, when Jesus steps up and says, hey, you know, when you're at the altar and everyone's like, yeah, 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 we know to do that. God wants a relationship with us. He says, leave your gift. Leave your gift if you got something going on with somebody else. They would have gone, oh, I, uh, what is this Jesus talking about? This is what my mama warned me about. What is he getting after? Jesus is saying the altar detects anger. Because also, when you went to the altar, you would have found two things and you still find them today. You're going to find others just like you. I mean, you went to the altar for one reason, to have your sins paid for so that you come back into a relationship with God. And it didn't matter how much money you had, and it didn't matter how bad your sins were, because they knew the truth. Sin isn't an amount, it's an effect. And the effect of sin is death. And you'd have everybody standing on equal ground before the altar, coming with their sacrifice. Name callers and murderers coming to be made right with a holy God. Everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. That's what the Bible says in Romans 3.23. And I think sometimes the altar will detect some contempt that might be brewing in our hearts. Where if Maybe we'll do the Christian thing. We'll say, oh, man, they really need Jesus. Oh, man, those people, they really need Jesus. They need to get saved. Man, they got to be in the front row at church. Like, we got to go. They got to go. But we don't see ourselves as that in need of the same reconciliation of Jesus. Sometimes there, there may be contempt for that person or those people. I mean, there probably is contempt if you would ever say to the question, is there anybody who shouldn't be at the altar of God today? And you're kind of secretly hoping like, yeah, I hope she doesn't show up. I hope he doesn't show up. I hope those people would never come to the altar. There might be some contempt lurking in your heart because make no mistake, God invited everybody to come to the altar and be made right with God. And then you also always find God's presence. You say, I don't see that in the text. Where is God's presence? It's in a little word. The word remember. See how it says a guy is standing there and all of a sudden he just remembers. God brings something to his heart. Don't think that he was just standing there and be like, oh yeah, you know that thing I got with Bert? Like that, man, I should really go sort that out. No, God says one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is that he will help you remember. Jesus told the disciples, the Holy Spirit's going to help you remember everything I taught you. The Holy Spirit helps you remember. And in the presence of God, this guy remembers, I have a relational issue. And God wants me to drop my gift 
and go take care of this thing. God brought the memory up. And I also want to say many people have used this passage and abused this passage because they'll say, if you've got something between God, don't you dare show up at church and don't go be around religious people. Come on, if that's what Jesus meant by this, none of us should be there. None of us should ever show up to church because we all got stuff going on. This is simply saying, let the altar search your heart. You know, when we come to church, when we come to Miracle City, we want to come and say to God, I actually want to interact with you. I don't want to do the religious thing where I'm just coming to check the box on a religious service and get my good thing done for today, and maybe God will think of me as a mildly more tolerable person. No, Jesus said, heaven is at hand. That's not what I want at all. I want you to open up and say, God, would you search my heart? Because you know my heart, and you know my motives even when I don't understand my motives. Isn't that what the psalmist prayed? Psalm 139, search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. See, when the Spirit does something inside of us, when we come into the presence of God, Jesus says, drop your gift. Meaning, drop the religious charades. Don't do the thing that some of us do where we come and we say, well, Christian ceremony can cover up the real spiritual issue of contempt in me. Jesus says, I don't want that. Because all that does is leaves you stuck and stranded in anger and sin. Jesus says, heaven is at hand. I have come to bring freedom, and I have come to bring life. See, it's the only way to defeat anger. It really is. Defeating anger, because when you walked to the altar, you would have seen a few things. You would have seen a priest who's going to help you make the sacrifice, and you would have seen a raging fire on top of the altar that had been burning for so long, consuming the sacrifices, because the fire was really a symbol to say this is God's judgment. God's judgment will fall on sin and completely consume it. And when people looked at the altar, they realized that is what needs to happen with my sin. That is what will happen with my life unless somebody else intercedes for me. And make no mistake, what Jesus was saying when he was teaching this is I will intercede. I am the altar, and I am the sacrifice. And on to the altar of the cross, Jesus would go and give his life and be completely consumed by the righteous wrath of God as he took upon our sins upon his shoulder. It's why Jesus is the only antidote to the anger in our hearts because he's the only one who could fulfill all the law and the prophets perfectly and take our sin onto himself and be completely consumed by the wrath of the Father so that you didn't have to. Because Jesus was consumed by our contempt. And then he died for contemptors like us. As people hurled insults at him on the cross, he prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And Jesus instead says, for those who struggle in contempt, I am freedom. I'm not just one of the solutions that the world has to offer. I'm not just preaching a new spin on religion. Jesus would say, I am the solution. As John Owen put it, the altar that we now have is Christ alone and his sacrifice. And do you realize what this does in our lives? Do you realize the freedom that is available in the cross of Jesus Christ? That when you come to that altar time and time again, it uncovers contempt, and then in the same moment, it unleashes grace into your life. Because Jesus died for people who were stuck and stranded in sin. And a lot of people think, well, God's just mad at sinful people, and he's just mad at people, and he's just an angry God. No, sin is what comes in between God and you. And because he loves us that much, that's why he has to be so mad at sin. Never mistake the anger of God at you. He's mad at what comes in between you and God. And he wants to unleash grace in our lives and unleash power in our lives. And it only comes through the gospel. And we would be so bold to stand on the truth and say the issue in the world with anger 
can only be overcome with Jesus because it's an issue of the heart and only Jesus can transform our hearts and make contemptors into those who have such compassion because we have been set free from it by the Spirit of the Lord. Can anybody testify to that this morning? Am I just, am I preaching in the right room today? Maybe. I got a mm-hmm. See, this is what we can say. We can say because there's reconciliation through the cross. There is now reconciliation through my life. I don't have to play the religious games. I don't have to pretend I got all my church stuff together and I got my sacrifice and God must be happy. He says, no, if you got something going on in your life, don't act like you're not free from that. Come on, the cross can set you free and then unleash grace in all of the relationships in your life. See, Jesus, Jesus says this. He says, first go and be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift. See, Jesus never says, just, just go be with people I don't want to be with you. He says, no, no, come on back and then you're going to offer your gift. He says, settle matters quickly with your adversary who has taken you to court and do it while you're still together on the way or your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. When you struggle with anger, run to the cross. That's the word of the Lord this morning. When you're feeling contempt, when you're dealing with anger, Christians run to the cross. And I want to give you four takeaway truths today that I think we see in the heart of Jesus is he's giving this example of what do we do at the altar? What do we do when we come to the cross where Jesus bled and died for me? I think the first thing he says is ask God for help. Ask God for help. N notice how God says, come and offer your gift. He says, come on back, offer your gift. And as I was writing this, I, I asked the Holy Spirit, because you know, you can talk to God. He'll, he'll talk back to you. He'll lead you back to his word. And I said, what, what does it mean to offer my gift? Like, I don't have any doves or pigeons or goats and stuff. And I felt the Spirit of the Lord saying, I never wanted goats. You're the gift. Do you realize in Jesus Christ, you are a gift. Every person, you are a gift to God. And he says, if you're angry, come to me. Come to me. He wants to be with you in the real pain that you've experienced, in the real things that are making you angry, he says, come to me. Bring yourself to me because you are a gift to God. You are worth dying for. You are worth God leaving heaven and coming to earth because he loves you that much. And God would simply say, come to me. Bring yourself to me. And I just declare in this church, because we're all about Jesus, the altar is always available here, and the altar is always available in your life. On Monday morning when you're angry, on Tuesday night when you're angry, on Thursday at 3 a.m. when you are so perplexed and upset by what's going on, the altar is available. The cross always invites us. It always is going to speak a better word over our lives. Ask God for help. And then he says, settle matters quickly. Settle matters quickly when, come on, maybe we tend to drag things out a little too long in our lives. Have you ever had a fight where you're fighting and you are so far away from the original fight that you had? You don't even understand what you're fighting about, but by golly, you are going to fight about it and you're going to get fierce about it. Man, I'm just preaching to me today. And you're so angry about it. Jesus says, hey, two things. You can stay angry about that or you can get freedom from that. So which do you want to do? There's always two options in our lives. You can stay angry, and you can live a life, even as a Christian following Jesus, but you'd be so stuck in the stronghold of anger. And Jesus says, well, let me give you another option. How about you just be free from it? And I'm not trying to oversimplify, please. There's, there's wisdom to this. This doesn't mean, like, go in haste and this massive years-long fight, you're going to solve in just a minute by saying sorry. There's, there's counseling involved. There's wisdom involved for this. But what Jesus is saying is, do what you can do today. Do what you can do today. There's reconciliation available at the cross. And we want to settle matters 
quickly. I think he's saying be angry at the problem, not the person. And oftentimes I can be guilty of being so angry at the person and forgetting about the problem. But make no mistake, people are not problems in God's kingdom. People have problems, but they're not problems. People are created in God's image. People are precious to God. They are worth dying for. And anybody who you may have a legitimate disagreement or be angry with, you also need to remind yourself God died for them. They are so beloved by heaven that Jesus went to the cross for them. And you know, I'll give you something that's, I'll admit it takes practice. And you're probably thinking like, man, I want to come over to your house when you're fighting because this is just, oh, this is amazing. You can. You're, you're not always going to see these things in action. I'm just a work in progress just like you too. But there's one thing that we've gotten pretty good at. We try to call out the problem instead of the person. We literally take a step back and we remind ourselves and say, you know what? I'm not fighting against you. I'm fighting for you. In this relationship, mm, I'm for you. But there's a problem here that's causing something, and I'm angry at that problem because that's coming in between us. So can we talk about the real problem? I wonder how many of your fights would change if you simply called out the real problem and started to invite the healing power of Jesus into the problem, because if Jesus is about to go to the cross and raise to new life, come on, what could Jesus bring to new life in the problems that you face? He's simply saying, call out the problem, not the person. And then he says, trust the judgment of God. Trust the judgment of God. Notice how Jesus gives a courtroom example. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to court or been with somebody in court, but it can kind of be an intense process. I mean, before you get to court, it's, it's, you're thinking this, it's kind of, you're all caught in your head about it, but when you get into that courtroom, there's something a little bit more intense that happens because the judge is sitting there, right? Before the courtroom, like, the judge is just more of an idea, but in the courtroom, the judge is there, and he can give a sentence that can change everything for you. And Jesus is saying, hey, you know the times when you've maybe seen him on the news, or maybe you've got a story with someone where they are so sure that they're innocent, I mean, they're so sure. I mean, like, they, they could not have possibly done anything wrong. It was all their fault. It was all their decision. They were just a, a helpless victim. And, and I'm sure if that's your story, I'm, I'm, you, you may be right. But then there's the moment where the sentencing comes down, and the person was just so blind to it. And they were guilty the whole time because, you know, the majority of problems have two people to fight. Jesus says, hey, if you're right, I'll make it right. D don't worry about it. I'm the judge of eternity past to eternity future. I'm going to make it right. But he also says, if we're wrong, he's also going to make it right. And sometimes we can be so blind to the motives of our heart that Jesus simply invites us and says, hey, you got to trust me with that stuff. If you're going to follow Jesus, you got to realize he's Savior and he's judge. And he is righteous and all that he decides, and he will be fair to you. So Jesus simply says, heaven is at hand. Why not be free from that? See, a lot of these things would show up in the ministry of Jesus. He preached the sermon, but then he went on to live the sermon. You know, that's our heart of Miracle City, by the way, just a little rabbit trail. We don't just want to preach a sermon, we want to live the sermon. We don't want Sundays to just happen and say, oh, that was good. No, Sundays get us ready to start living this stuff out. And in one of the places that Jesus went, he, he told this parable to people who were struggling with a little bit of forgiveness. It, it may surprise you who it was, because in Matthew 18, Peter runs up to Jesus, and he asks him, hey, Jesus, rabbi, who called me to follow you, how many times do I have to forgive somebody who sins against me? Seven times? Which I think is funny. What do you think happened with Peter that he would run up and tell Jesus this? Like, which one of the disciples did something annoying? And he's like, all right, Jesus, is this the one where I get to, like, kick him out of the group? Like, how many times I got to forgive him? Jesus says, hold on. Jesus replied, 70 times seven. 
which makes me think Peter might have been bad at math. But it wasn't Jesus giving a specific number. He was saying, it's more than you can calculate on the fly, Peter. It's keep forgiving. Keep reconciling. Keep going the extra mile. Keep responding to what the Lord is doing. It's not a one-time thing. Whenever this comes up in your life, you've got to keep going to the altar. You've got to keep going to the cross that gives us freedom. And then Jesus tells a parable. He says, so uh, assume there was this guy, and he owed a huge, like, debt, like, like millions and millions of dollars, and he went to the, to the king, and, you know, king's oversee kingdom. So Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God. And he says, so say this guy comes and says, I, I can't pay it. I, I gotta go to prison, or you're gonna have to do something, or I'm gonna sell my whole family into slavery because I can't pay it. And the king has mercy on him and says, no, I'll cancel all of your debt. And this guy's like, for, for what? He says, just because I'm merciful. That's who I am. It's almost like you can hear the king saying, heaven's at hand. I can cancel it right now, so go free. And Jesus said, this guy who'd just been forgiven so much, he ran out into the street and he saw somebody who owed him a couple bucks, and he went and he shook him down, and he said, give me what you owe me, and he tossed him into prison when he couldn't pay. And it says, when the others found out about it, they went and told the king what had just happened to the one who had received so much mercy yet was not merciful with others. Jesus says this in Matthew 18. He said, In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. And look at me. Jesus is not trying to scare you. He's inviting you to step into the freedom of forgiveness forgiveness to other people who may have harmed us because we have been forgiven eternally from the cross of Christ. Heaven is at hand. This is the new kingdom way of living where the reconciled now become reconcilers, where those who have been set free by Jesus are now part of setting the debts of others free by leading them to Jesus. The ones who deserved justice are now the ones bringing people to the altar of justice and pointing them to the only one who has the antidote for anger. And his name is Jesus. And heaven is at hand. And it's extended to us today.